for many children who have been abused. The trauma does not end after Child Protective Services intervenes. Failure to protect laws serve to remove these children from non-offending parents, re-victimizing the same children the system is supposed to safeguard, and effectively punishing domestic violence victims. What's worse is that these children frequently end up in foster care and group homes where they are abused once again. Flash forward a dozen or so years, these children who were abused and then abused again in foster care are now considered at risk for committing child abuse themselves and their tragic histories can be used as ammunition against them in CPS proceedings that all too often lack merit. Talia is a domestic violence survivor. She also survived childhood physical and emotional abuse at the hands of her foster mother. But the worst of her struggles was the removal of her children by CPS. This is Talia's story. Hi, my name is Talia Littlefield. I was born in Oakland, California in 1987, which was the crack era. I was born addicted to crack cocaine. My mother was an addict. Um, I stayed in Oakland at the hospital for three days. After that, I was put into foster care and I was being raised by my aunt. For some time, things seemed to be going well until I can remember as early as being three years old where the mental abuse started where she wanted to manipulate me to tell foster care and CPS and social workers and whoever else that I did not want to be placed back with my mother. So I did, I told them that. And then time went by and that's when the mental more mental and physical, emotional and verbal abuse started. She was very abusive. Um, when I was 14 years old, she got incarcerated for attacking me at a strip mall in Oakland, California. And I didn't press charges because of that. Um, because of the attack, I had to go to a group home and um, I stayed at the group home for about a week and my aunt contacted me and we talked. As I said, I didn't press charges, so I was placed back into her care and the abuse continued until I ran away. Fast forward, um, I was emancipated at 17 years old. That is the time also when I got pregnant with my oldest daughter. Um, things seemed to go good. I got an apartment. Um, I lost the apartment partially due to my aunt listening to the things that she told me. So then I end up having to go stay back with her and the verbal abuse continued. I end up leaving again and Things just, you know, it continued to get worse. I didn't really have family to turn to. Um, my mother was really never there for me. I don't know my father. So things just turned for, turned for worse. I started going to jail. Um, I got out. After some years doing, going back and forth, I started doing okay. Um, at this point, I'm 24, living in Oakland, and um, I end up getting in a relationship with the guy that I had known since we were children, but we didn't see each other for a long time. Um, My oldest daughter, her dad, was addicted to drugs, so he wasn't around. And my middle daughter, my youngest daughter's dad, he was in prison, so he wasn't around. So I get with this guy, and the guy started immediately 
about a week after we start dealing with each other, started physically, mentally, uh, verbally, and um, physically abusing me. And um, I ended up finding out shortly after that he molested my children. And after finding these things out, when I reported it, because I did, I reported it. My daughter told me why she was at Children's Hospital in Oakland, California. I immediately reported it. And that's when everything went left. When the system got involved, um, the system pretty much turned it on me saying that I allowed these things to happen to my children, um, that I failed to protect my children. Um, the system wouldn't help me and my kids. I asked them multiple things, you know, as far as in regards to protect me and my children because this person is a gang member who did this to my children. Me and my children were in danger. We were receiving death threats. Um, I let the law know this and they pretty much failed to protect us in every way possible. Every avenue that I gave them to protect me and my kids, the answer was no. I was even told when I asked could my kids take a, um, a lie detector test I was told that that's only in the movies. It's invincible in court. So um, it took four and a half months for me and my children to get an emergency move because at the time I had Section 8. We ended up moving to Vallejo. We stayed there for about six months. And then because I stopped going to court because me and my children were receiving death threats, um, I got incarcerated. told them if it was good they x the people out if it was bad they used those people to come lie on me it didn't matter if the people were lying they knew majority of the people were lying I really have a relationship with my children i barely talk to my children i don't get to see my children um For five years, I forgot to say, for five years, they had a restraining order on me um, so that I couldn't, if I was to go see my children, I would possibly go to jail. Now, I'm not gonna lie. I violated the restraining order multiple times. I'm not telling anybody else to do that, but with me, with my kids, that's just a risk I was willing to take because I felt like my kids needed me. They had been molested. My kids have been molested and snatched away from me. I've, I literally lost everything in an instant when I reached out for help, all because I reached out for help. Well, it's not all because I reached out for help. It's because one, I'm black. Two, I'm a single mom. Three, I have a record. And four, I was a good mom. Five, when the system sees that you are a good parent, 
that a lot of them, and you're black, they feel like you're a minority. You don't have to be black, you can be a minority. If you are a minority, you don't have the money, you know, the attorneys, they are gonna do whatever they can to make sure that they destroy you. They want to take our kids. They use them for sex trades, for organ trades. And as for us adults, they're just gonna turn everybody against you and hope that you go crazy so that they can put you in a mental institution or you can end up in prison. Because if they don't have you in a mental institution, they don't have you in jail, they don't have our children in CPS, how else will they continue to get these checks? So that's pretty much what they did with me and my kids. Um, it was a long fight. I had to stop because I knew that they were not gonna give me my children back. It didn't matter what I did. It didn't matter who said anything good about me. It didn't matter the facts that they had as me being a good parent. Um, this is just something that they had, they made up in their mind. They're taking the kids. They're not getting them, giving them back. So I moved on with my life. Um, I still love my kids and I'm still fighting for my kids, but instead I'm fighting in other ways. My only advice to any parent who is going through the things that I've went through, um, fighting for your children, please continue to fight for your children. The fight is not over. It doesn't stop when they remove the kids from the home. That's when it starts. And you have to be that mama or that papa bear. Because if we not going to fight for our kids, who else is going to fight for them? It's clear the system or not. They're going to throw our kids on medication and try to do whatever it is to ruin a relationship that we have with our kids. So just stay strong. Don't give up. Please join the fight to bring our children back. Please become an advocate for not only your children, but for all of the children that's going through this. Because as I said, they cannot speak for themselves. And it really takes a village. It takes a village. It's not a I and we. We are the people who have to take care of these kids. It doesn't matter what race they are, they're children, and they deserve the best. And we have to give it to them. So please just, please just continue to fight for the babies. They're our future. My name is Michelle D. Chan. I am founder and director of California Families Rise, a NorCal activist group holding the family regulation system accountable. This video is the fifth in a series featuring the real life stories of those most impacted by foster care and adoption. The video footage featured here was all taken at our protests over the years. And the stories are all stories of our members. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like and share this video, and follow us on social media.